Ever wondered what Jesus taught about the concept of hell? This is a question that has sparked countless discussions, debates and interpretations over the centuries. It's a topic that's as profound as it is contentious. Some see hell as a literal place of eternal torment, while others view it symbolically, a metaphor for separation from God. Yet regardless of personal beliefs or interpretations, the teachings of Jesus on hell remain a critical part of Christian theology. In the next few minutes, we'll journey through the scriptures, exploring the various instances where Jesus spoke about hell. From his first mention in the Sermon on the Mount to his final teachings in the Great Commission, we'll seek to understand the context, the symbolism and the messages embedded in these teachings. So, are you ready to embark on this enlightening journey? Join us as we dive into the scriptures, exploring the teachings of Jesus on this profound topic. The first mention of hell by Jesus comes from the famous Sermon on the Mount. Here, Jesus delivers a groundbreaking speech that has shaped Christian thought for centuries. It's from this same sermon that we first hear Jesus speak about hell, specifically in the verses of Matthew 5.22 and 5.29. 30. In verse 22, Jesus addresses anger, saying, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Here, Jesus uses the term Gehenna, which is often translated into English as hell. The original term Gehenna derives from the Valley of Hinnom, a location near Jerusalem where trash was burned and where in the past some Israelites sacrificed their children to pagan gods. This imagery of a burning, desolate place was used by Jesus to symbolize the final place of judgment for the wicked. Moving on to verses 29 and 30, Jesus speaks about sin and its consequences. He states that it's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The message is pretty clear. Sin leads to spiritual death, symbolized by the fiery Gehenna. In this context, Jesus is not promoting self-mutilation, but rather emphasizing the seriousness of sin. He's urging his followers to take drastic action in turning away from sin, highlighting that it's better to give up something we might think we need rather than risk our whole being cast into hell. This first mention of hell in Jesus' teachings is a strong warning. It's a call to recognize the weight of our actions, the severity of sin, and the dire consequences that follow if we don't turn away from it. Jesus is telling us in no uncertain terms that our choices here and now have eternal implications. Clearly, Jesus used strong language to warn his listeners about the danger of hell. He implores us to take sin seriously, to repent and to seek God's forgiveness. His words are not just a cautionary tale, but also an invitation to choose a path of righteousness over a path of destruction. Jesus often taught through parables, one of which gives us insight into his view on hell. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus, found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, is a powerful illustration of Jesus' teachings on hell. This story is unique as it's the only parable where Jesus gives a name to a character, Lazarus, making it more personal and poignant. The parable begins with a rich man who lived a life of luxury, dressed in fine linen and purple, enjoying sumptuous feasts every day. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came and licked his sores. The contrast between the lives of the two men is stark and profound. As the story unfolds, both men die. Lazarus is carried by the angels to Abraham's side, a symbol of comfort and peace in the hereafter, while the rich man finds himself in Hades, tormented in flame. The rich man sees Lazarus in the distance, comfortable by Abraham's side, and begs for mercy, for even a drop of water to soothe his torment. However, Abraham reminds him of his life of luxury on earth and Lazarus's life of suffering. Now, their roles were reversed. There's a great chasm fixed between the two realms, preventing any movement between them. The rich man then pleads for his brothers still living, but Abraham tells him they have the teachings of Moses and the prophets and they should heed their words. 
The crux of this parable lies in its stark depiction of the afterlife and the consequences of our earthly actions. It's a compelling reminder of the importance of compassion, humility, and living in accordance with God's commandments. Through this parable, Jesus paints a vivid picture of the consequences of ignoring God's commandments. Jesus didn't shy away from discussing the final judgment and its implications. Let's delve into one of the most profound messages Jesus shared about the final judgment found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Here, Jesus paints a vivid picture of a world divided, a time when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Jesus speaks of a time when all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep, those who have lived righteously, will be placed on his right hand, while the goats, those who have not, on the left. He then addresses the righteous, commending them for their acts of kindness and love. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. The righteous will be surprised, asking when they had done these deeds for him. Jesus replies, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Conversely, to those on his left, he admonishes, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These individuals are condemned for their lack of compassion, their failure to feed the hungry, quench the thirsty, or welcome the stranger. This parable underscores Jesus' emphasis on love, compassion, and selflessness. It's a call to action to live our lives in service of others, reflecting the love and compassion that Jesus himself embodied. But it's also a stark reminder of the consequences of living a self-centered life devoid of compassion. Jesus pulls no punches here. He speaks of eternal punishment for those who neglect the needs of the least of these. This passage leaves us with a clear warning about the reality of hell. Before his ascension, Jesus left his disciples with a critical task and a sobering warning. This directive, known as the Great Commission, is recorded in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Here Jesus speaks to his disciples, saying, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This parting instruction from Jesus holds great significance. It's a call to action, a mandate for all followers of Christ to spread the good news of salvation throughout the world. But it's not just an action, it's a responsibility. A responsibility that comes with a stark reminder of the eternal consequences for those who choose not to believe. In this verse, Jesus emphasizes the importance of faith for salvation. He clearly states that those who believe and are baptized will be saved, affirming the path to eternal life. While these words are filled with hope and promise for believers, they also carry a stern warning. Jesus explicitly mentions that those who do not believe will be condemned. The weight of these words cannot be understated. They highlight the seriousness of disbelief and the eternal implications it carries. In the context of Jesus' teachings on hell, the Great Commission brings to the forefront the dire consequences of disbelief. The message is clear. Belief is not optional, it is vital for salvation, and the stakes are high, they are eternal, but let's not forget the other side of the coin. The Great Commission is also a message of hope. It's a call to all, regardless of who they are or where they come from, to believe in the Gospel and be saved.